All right, welcome everybody to our CAP seminar this week. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the week, Anoma Ganguly. She is a graduate student at the Tata Institute in Mumbai, and she'll be graduating next year. And today she's here to tell us about rich cosmological signatures of composite dark matter. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work in this seminar. So. Um, this work, uh, today I'm going to tell you about cosmological signatures of composite dark matter. And this work is done in collaboration with uh, Rishi Khatri and Tuhin Roy at TIFR. Okay, so let's begin. Yeah, so as we know, dark matter comprises a major fraction of matter content in our universe. And apart from its gravitational interactions, we know very little about it. So one of the ways in which people look for dark matter is through indirect dark matter searches. But in indirect dark matter searches, till now the focus has been on emission signatures of dark matter. What I mean by that, that we try to look for excess standard model particles like E plus E minus pairs or photons. And we try to probe dark matter through decay or annihilation channels. On the other hand, absorption signatures of dark matter is a very less studied topic, and uh, we can do a lot with it. So the idea here is that if we have dark matter, which has some uh, electromagnetic interaction such that it can absorb light from the photon, absorb light or absorb photons from the background source, this can imprint uh, a spectral feature in the spectrum of the background source. And through these spectral features, if we find some new feature which we cannot identify with baryonic atoms or molecules, this might be telling us about dark matter. Okay, so <clears throat> to understand how these uh, spectral features can get imprinted, uh, we can simply take dark matter to be a two-state system. Uh, so this is the ground state and chi star is the excited state with an energy splitting delta E. Now dark matter will occupy both the ground state and the excited state. And this is something that we can express using the Boltzmann law where N0 and N by N0 by N1 represents the ratio of dark matter particles in the two states. Uh, which is equal to the ratio of degeneracy factors. And inside the exponential, we have the energy splitting, which in temperature units is T star. And T excitation represents uh, the temperature that decides the population in the two states. So now we have uh, a two-state dark matter. And the different interactions that can change the population of dark matter particles in the two states could be of two kinds. Because we are looking for signatures using photons, one of them is electromagnetic transitions. So dark matter can absorb light, go to the excited state, or it could even emit light uh, and go to the ground state. So this we can, these rates we can express using um, atomic physics, like in terms of Einstein coefficients, Bs and As. The other interaction that can happen is dark matter can collide inelastically. So two dark matter particles collide, and that can also cause dark matter to go to excited state or de-excite. So the effect of these, this physics uh, can imprint a spectral feature in the, spec, in, in the CMB, and that is what I'll try to explain now. So we have dark matter here, and then we have dark matter transitions, two state transitions between uh, chi and chi star, ground state and excited state. And as I discussed, there are two processes. One is just absorption of or emission of a photon. So this, if, if the radiative transitions due to CMB photons um, is the strongest interaction, then the, the two-level system will come in equilibrium with CMB. So excitation temperature will uh, come in equilibrium with the CMB temperature if dark matter, dark matter collisions are strong, then they will decide what the population of particles in the two states would be. So they will bring the excitation temperature in, e in equilibrium with the dark matter temperature. Okay, so now um, here I'll try to explain how uh, this physics can imprint a global absorption signal in the spectrum of the CMB. So on the right hand, on the left hand side, here is a plot for temperature versus redshift. 
for CMB, dark matter and excitation temperature. And on the right hand side, this is the CMB intensity in temperature units with respect to a black body. So if it is a, if it is a black body, then it, this is a perfect horizontal line like this. If this goes below zero, then this goes in absorption. So let's try to see how an absorption signal can get imprinted. So at very high redshifts, dark matter and CMB would be in thermal equilibrium. That's somewhere here. Now once dark matter, uh, the, the scattering of dark matter with electrons and CMB photons becomes below, goes below the expansion rate, then, then dark matter is no longer kinematically decoup kinetically decoup sorry, kinematically coupled to CMB. So its temperature can now start falling as 1 plus z square because it is non-relativistic. Now at these high redshifts, the collisions, uh, inelastic collisions between dark matter particles is the dominant process. So that will bring the excitation temperature in equilibrium with dark matter temperature. So blue now starts falling, following the black line. And as we go to lower redshifts, because dark matter number density is falling, uh, ultimately collisions will become weak and it's the radiative transitions due to CMB photons that take over. And that brings the excitation temperature or the two level, two states of dark matter in equilibrium with CMB. So on the left hand side, you can see that when inelastic collisions dominate, because the two states are at a temperature which is much lower than CMB, they can now start absorbing the CMB photons. And that creates this absorption signal over here. And then when the two systems, the two level system comes in equilibrium with CMB, then there is no longer absorption or emission. So the signal vanishes. Okay, so the physics that I told you about till now only involved dark matter and CMB. But we also have baryons and the different interactions between electrons, ions, and CMB photons determine what the CMB spectrum would look like. So what I showed earlier was this absorption feature. But this global feature imprinted by dark matter gets converted into mu type distortions in 10 to the 5 to 2 into 10 to the 6 redshift uh, range because Compton scattering of electrons with photons will efficiently distribute the photons in the CMB spectrum and that will essentially convert this global signal into a mu type distortion. Then when we go to lower redshifts, um, this, uh, this absorption will get converted to Y type distortions because Bremsstrahlung will create photons and, uh, and uh, erase the absorption feature here. And then whatever inefficient scattering happens between CMB and uh, electrons will create a Y type distortion. And then in this small region, there can be a global absorption signal which can be imprinted by dark matter. But uh, the specific uh, redshift at which this absorption signal will emerge very much depends on which part of the uh, which part of the CMB spectrum from which part of the CMB spectrum dark matter is absorbing the photons from. So now uh, I'll come to one of the observations that was there in 2018, where uh, Edge's collaboration observed. Uh, a strong absorption signal in 50 to 100 megahertz range, which is the best fit signal is shown by the black dash line, and uh, gray band shows the uncertainty. And we found that um, through our dark matter model, we could produce strong uh, signals uh, which have larger amplitudes and narrower shapes, which is consistent with edges. But um, of course, another experiment called SARAS has ruled out edges. So this uh, feature is a general prediction of our model, which could arise in any part of the CMB spectrum. So now I will come towards what uh, we might expect to see in a more sensitive experiment like Pixie, which will look at the main CMB band. So before that, um, I told you about mm, the global absorption feature, but we can also have an emission feature. And this physics is very different from anything that happens um, in, for example, 21 centimeter cosmology, which can also imprint a global absorption signal. So here again, it, this is temperature versus redshift. 
and again the differential CMB intensity, that is intensity of CMB with respect to black body as a function of frequency. So at very high redshifts, collisions dominate. They bring excitation temperature in equilibrium with dark matter temperature. But if the collisions as well as the radiative transitions, the rates for both of these processes becomes, uh, b goes below the Hubble expansion rate, then these two processes can no longer influence the two states of dark matter or the excitation temperature. So here is this intermediate region where there is a freeze out and the excitation temperature uh, remains constant. And if this goes above the CMB temperature, then basically the two states of dark matter can start emitting photons. And this will imprint an emission signal, something like this. So now when we do a scan over different parameter space for different collisions, for, dif for different collision rates, different radiative transition rates for different masses, we find that uh, there can be very unique signals that can be imprinted by dark matter in the CMB spectrum, which would be sensitive to pixie. So here is a plot showing all the different, uh, the blue ones showing all the different signals that dark matter can imprint in the CMB spectrum. The, the red and the black uh, signals show the mu and y distortions. These are something that we expect from standard cosmology. And these signals would be sensitive to pixie. If dark matter imprints signals which has distinct shapes, then we could even um, separate these signals and try to know about what dark matter could be. OK, so now uh, from CMB, I will go to another source, which is uh, a compact astrophysical source, for example, a quasar. And if along the line of sight to the quasar, we have, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, I was just asking in the the frequency spectrum. It, so there was a broad peak. Um, to, am I right that the uh, intrinsic emission is a line, but it's spread out due to the redshift history of the emission? Is that right? Uh, sorry, this this plot? Sure, or the, or the one before showing the emission. Um, this one? Yeah. So yeah, is it correct that the emission are... itself is a line, but then it's spread by the by the redshift history? Right, right. So, so this uh, in the right hand side plot, this frequency that I'm showing on the x-axis can be written in terms of redshift. So this basically represents emission at each redshift. Got it. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Now we'll talk about what can happen if we have an astrophysical compact source and along the line of sight to the source, we have a dark matter halo. So if dark matter can absorb photons from the background source, then all the dark matter particles along the line of sight can absorb photons and that can imprint an absorption signal. So this is something that we express in terms of optical depth where the observed flux is given by the intrinsic flux times exponential uh, with the suppression of the optical depth. Okay, so here I've tried to just explain mm, the dependence of optical depth on different dark matter parameters. So A10 is the Einstein coefficient. This has all the physics which involves interaction of dark matter with photons. Uh, then it also depends on the number density of dark matter particles along the line of sight. Also, what would be the velocity distribution of particles along the line of sight? So that would give a width to this line. And we have the excitation temperature, which is basically the temperature that decides the population of dark matter particles in the two states. So um, for a simple analysis, uh, we consider two extreme scenarios. Like I discussed, there are two processes. One is through uh, CMB photon, sorry, one is the um, absorption or emission of a photon that can change the two states of dark matter. So we first consider that that is the dominant process and put excitation temperature is equal to CMB temperature. The second is collisional case where we assume that dark matter, dark matter collisions are strong and that brings the excitation temperature in equilibrium with the dark matter halo temperature. 
So, um, so here is a plot for the absorption line in case of collisionless dark matter and collision, collisional dark matter for three different halo masses. So this plot shows that the absorption feature imprinted by dark matter would be sensitive to dark matter self interactions. So in case of collisionless dark matter, when we increase the halo mass, the amplitude of absorption increases because there is more dark matter there to absorb uh, photons. But in collisional dark matter, the amplitude falls. This happens because in collisional dark matter, the population of dark matter particles in the two state is decided by the halo temperature. So if you have larger mass halo, then larger temperature means there are lesser particles in the ground state to absorb photons. Okay, so um, before, so right till now I told you what happens when we have a single dark matter halo. But in principle, we could have multiple dark matter halos along the line of sight. And each of these halos could absorb photon at a rest frame frequency. But because these halos are at different redshifts, they will imprint absorption lines which shift differently and can create a forest. This forest is similar to 21 centimeter forest. And this is a collection of absorption lines uh, with an amplitude and a width, and one can do uh, statistics with it and try to understand what that tells us about dark matter and the large scale structure. Okay, so, so with all these collection of lines, what we did was we generated a mock spectra for 100 different line of sites, and this is the histogram for the peak of these lines for collisional and collisionless dark matter. So you can see that these lines um, can distinguish the nature of dark matter. So um, the collisional dark matter has stronger absorption in the tail. S the second thing that it is sensitive to is the halo mass function. Because if we have larger, if we have lower cutoff uh, on the halo mass function, that means there are more number of halos along the line of sight. So there will be more absorption. So these histograms are also sensitive to that. The next thing uh, we looked at was the line width. So absorption line has an amplitude and it also has a width. And the width of these lines is decided by the temperature of the halo. So if we have lower cutoff on the halo mass function, we have smaller mass halos, which have smaller temperature. So the histogram extends to lower values of line width. So in this sense, uh, dark forest is a new window to um, uh, understand the large scale structure in our universe. Okay, so now coming to detectability. Um, we could look for these new lines in any part of the electromagnetic spectrum, right from radio to x-rays. And uh, the experiments shown below the black lines are, are the ones that would be sensitive to dark forest because the resolution they have is, um, is good enough that they can resolve around 10 to the minus 4 delta nu by nu. The second thing would be that if we look at the 20 to 40 gigahertz band of VLA, then uh, our explanation for the edges can be validated by looking at this band because this will correspondingly have a forest. Okay, so now um, coming to what kind of dark matter model uh, can give rise to these lines. So um, this is a proof of principle model that we came up with where dark matter is a composite particle of two elementary particles having epsilon minus epsilon charges. So dark matter as a whole is electromagnetically neutral. But dark matter also has to be stable. It cannot ionize in, uh, in uh, very easily. So we introduce strong interactions in the dark sector. And these, uh, this model is similar to heavy mesons of the standard model sector. And because this is a bound state of two particles having two spin half uh, elementary particles, we can have a spin zero state and a spin one state. So the transitions can actually come from hyperfine splitting. So once we have a model, we can write a Lagrangian for that. And uh, there are different direct detection experiments which put constraints on the interaction of dark matter 
uh, or the cross section interaction cross section of dark matter with electrons so this is mev dark matter so uh, all the experiments that give constraints on dark matter electron scattering are the ones that uh, put the strongest constraints so here i have shown the constraint on the electric charge of constituent as a function of dark matter transition energy so this is the direct detection constraint in for smaller transition energies this constraint is dominated by inelastic scattering uh, where dark matter electron can electron scattering can excite dark matter particles the right hand side here is for elastic scattering the change happens because uh, kinematically uh, the initial kinetic energy has to be enough that dark matter uh, can go to the excited state in these regions here um, uh, the 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 absorption lines that we would get from dark matter would have uh, optical depth greater than 0.01 so these would be something that would be detectable so if uh, if we actually look at the data for these transition energies or corresponding frequency bands then dark forest will become an even better probe than direct detection and cmb constraints okay the other thing that one can do is that um, cobe puts very strong constraints on the on the spectral distortion on different kinds of spectral distortions in the cmb so the two kinds of spectral distortions are mu and y so our dark matter model as i explained before can uh, result in both mu and y distortions and we can use these limits to constrain again the electric charge of the constituent as a function of transition energy so the total distortion is um, a sum total of mu and y mu distortion depends on two quantities one is the fractional energy that is taken away from cmb and the fractional number of photons that is taken away from cmb so here i have tried to show uh, the this universal distortion parameter and how it changes with transition energy and electric charge so what happens at low delta e values or lower transition energies is this delta n by n term dominates and because because we are taking away photons both these terms are negative so because this dominates mu is positive in these regions but when we go to higher transition energies the fractional energy change again starts dominating and the distortion parameter changes sign and becomes negative somewhere here so cobe uh, put strong limits in 0.1 ev to 50 electron volt transition energies somewhere here and because pixie would be even more sensitive four orders of magnitude sensitive than cobe the constraints would become even stronger okay so now i would uh, conclude so in our work we have proposed uh, unique signatures of dark matter that could be found using uh, different absorption lines in the spectrum for background source the background source if it is a if it is cmb these can emerge as uh, uh, global signals which can be distinguished from standard signals if it is a quasar this will this can give rise to absorption lines which could be dark forest that could open a new window to the large scale structure and we can already look for these signatures in existing data so thank you So why why is the pixie contour bigger than cobe's contour? Because pixie is going to pixie is more sensitive than cobe. Pixie would be more sensitive than cobe. Uh -huh. So the the limits on mu and y would be four orders of magnitude stronger. So uh, we'd be able to rule out even <coughs> smaller values of epsilon and So, and then in in the previous plot, so you showed. Uh, um, okay, so yeah, uh, so you had a plot where you showed the mu, y, and then you showed different yeah, different yeah, curves yeah. for uh, yeah that plot. Um, so so all the so the right so so mu and y are there. So those are those are 
are, are those coming from like primary, like primordial density perturbations? Yeah, yeah. So okay. this was just to show that there are mu and y that we expect from standard cosmology. Right. But dark matter can imprint shapes that could be different from mu and y. So right. we could, we would, we might be able to distinguish them. Right. And you're saying pixie is more sensitive and just because of the, just because of the sensitivity and the, yeah, and the resolution, yeah. you're yeah. saying, okay, pixie is more sensitive. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, on the very last plot you showed, there's also another spot where the distortion parameter is negative. Is that the same? Like, are they, are they both due to the same reason why the distortion parameter is negative? Or is there something else going on on that left-hand side of the plot? Uh, so, uh, which, which part of the upper left? This region? Yeah, right. So, so the total distortion is a sum of mu and y. So y only depends on fractional energy change. So this is always negative. And this is where it contributes the most. So that's why this region looks blue in color. Brian, you can ask your question. Oh yeah, thanks. So uh, so thanks for your talk. So the uh, so the uh, the the intrinsic the the line itself, the position of the line is telling you about the structure of the dark matter, right? Because it's telling you about this energy gap between the two levels. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that of course is very interesting by itself because it's telling you about the structure of the dark matter. So is there maybe you said this, but uh, so you'd want to know just in the rest frame what that is. And so I guess from there, you could get that from absorption in our own halo. Is there a prospect of seeing that? Like uh, To identify whether a line is coming from dark matter? Yeah, in our own halo, right. So then it's not redshifted, and then you get to find out what the sort of rest frame, you know, wavelength of the line is. Right. So, uh, yeah, it should be possible to do that. Um, like if we look specifically look at bands where we don't expect lines from standard um, like baryonic atoms and molecules, uh, if we find a line there, it might be possible to identify whether it is from dark matter. Um, the other thing that we were thinking was uh, to identify source and uh, absorber pairs. Like from DAISY, we have the spectra of different galaxies and quasars. And uh, we can get a galaxy catalog also. So we can actually identify source and absorbers and then stack them up. And if we find a line somewhere, that could be uh, one way to look for it, for dark matter line. Great. That's nice. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, so I had a very similar question. Um, can you go back to your plot where you showed uh, you know, the plot where you can search for these features in the entire electromagnetic spectrum? Yeah. Right. No, I think, I think, I think it's one where you had all the experiments, yeah. So, so here the black line is, so that basically just comes from the resolution of your... Yeah, right? yeah, the width of the... Right. Line. But, but then, yeah, like, like Brian was asking, I mean, there are like so many other absorption features, right? So, how, like, for, presumably, you cannot search for these features in, in, in a region where there is like a very strong Lyman alpha forest or something, right? Mm, right, right. There it so, would be difficult. But. Right. So, uh, and then obviously there's also like nice and all of these things. So, do, do you actually... in the have... radio region, like where at... NL, in radio, yeah, sure. Yeah, frequencies below CO and right. close to 21 centimeter. There one could look for these lines. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> 